morning, everyone. Just what a wonderful time in God's presence. And I always say this, we should never take the presence of God for granted. And what would church be without the presence of God? I don't want to ever come into an atmosphere where it's just dry and where you can't feel anything. And so it's also about our participation in that as well. And when God's presence is moving, just to tap into that. And there's so much that can be found in the presence of God. And so just a very warm welcome once again to each and every one of you, especially if this is your first time. Thank you for choosing to fellowship at Access Church. You could have been anywhere this morning. You could have even been in bed, but you were here this morning. So thank you. Now, last week we started a brand new series called Four Faces, and I'm so excited about the series and last week was part one, which was just basically an introduction. And we, we laid the foundation for the series. Because when you see that title, Four Faces, sometimes you wonder, what exactly are we speaking about? Maybe you've never come across uh, even the subject before. And so I just want to start this morning. Maybe you weren't here last week, and maybe you didn't have the time to catch up uh, via YouTube. But I want to start this morning by way of a quick recap. Now, as I said last week, Sunday, in order for you and I to develop a deep relationship with God and to become more Christ-like in all of our ways, we not only need to know what Jesus has done for us, uh, you know, what we have access to, the victory we have over, but we also need to know who He is. I believe each and every one of us need to have a greater revelation of who is it that we serve. As Mel mentioned, even in our time of worship, the God that we serve is so multifaceted. And everything we need can actually be found in Him. You don't have to go searching. Everything we need can be found in Him. And so, our Christian life must not only about, uh, be about seeking God's hand, what we can get from Him, it must also be about seeking His face, who He is, living a lifestyle of intimacy with Him. In 2 Peter 3, from verse 17 to 18, the Bible tells us that we should grow in our knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grow in our knowledge so that in actual fact we will not be led astray. Just learn more about who He is. Now, it is the Holy Spirit who reveals Jesus to us. And in, in actual fact, our salvation is a di direct result of the Holy Spirit drawing us to Jesus. But as we get to know more about Him, it's the Holy Spirit that reveals Him to us, and the primary way that the Holy, Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to us is through the Word of God. That is why the Word of God is so important. The Word of God is our instruction manual. Someone once said that a good acronym for Bible, B-I-B-L-E, is basic instructions before leaving earth. God has given us some basic instructions. And whenever you buy a new product, I always say this at our discovery track classes, every new product comes with a manual. And some of us don't like to read the instruction manual, and that's why when we buy some things and we try to assemble it, we find all of these extra parts and we're like, I wonder where this goes. Why? <laughs> because we didn't read the instruction manual. But God has given us an instruction manual. And sometimes when you don't read the instruction manual, you don't realize all of the features of the product that you, you bought. I always use this example, Man, Mel and I bought a Renault Triber. And for one year, I didn't realize that if I plugged my phone in through the USB, that that screen that was in front of me could display the navigation. I was just using the navigation on my phone instead of plugging the phone in so the navigation could appear on the screen. Why? Because I didn't read the instruction manual, I didn't realize the full features of the product. And sometimes we don't realize who we are, but we also don't realize who God is because we don't go to His Word. And we need to go to the Word of God. As I said, one of the greatest challenges we have in this generation is biblical illiteracy, not understanding the Word of God. Now in the Bible there are four books that give us a biography of the life of Jesus. And these are known as the four Gospels, and the word Gospel means good news, the good news about Jesus Christ. And last week we looked at how each of the four Gospels were penned by four different writers, and each of these writers were actually writing to a different audience. 
The Gospel of Matthew was written by one of uh, Jesus' 12 disciples named Matthew, who was a tax collector, and he was from the tribe of Levi, and he was writing to the Jewish people. Being a Jewish man, he was writing to the Jewish people. The second Gospel, the Gospel of Mark, uh, was written by someone who was not one of the 12 disciples, uh, but he was a spiritual son of Peter, and his name was John Mark, and he was writing to the Romans. That's the audience he was writing to. The next gospel, the gospel of Luke, was written by quite a learned, educated man who was a physician. His name was Luke. He was a spiritual son of Paul. And he was not Jewish, but he was Greek. And so he was writing to a Greek audience. And then the last gospel, which is very different to the other three gospels, the gospel of John, was written by John the Beloved. Uh, He was a disciple of Jesus, part of Jesus' inner circle, along with his brother James and along with Peter. And when John writes, he writes to the entire world. And that is why when people come to salvation, what we encourage them to do is to start in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, just a great place to start if you are new to the faith. Now because the Gospels were written by different authors and because they had been written to a specific audience, each Gospel actually focuses on a different facet of who Jesus is. And each gospel actually highlights a different face of Jesus. But all the gospels come together beautifully to give us the full picture of who Jesus is. Who is this God that we serve? And the amazing thing, as I pointed out last week, is that each of these faces or facets of Jesus are not just seen in the gospels, but we also are given a picture of this in two other portions of scripture in the Bible, one in the Old Testament found in the book of Ezekiel and another in the New Testament found in the book of Revelation. Last week we read the book of Revelation chapter 4 and I'm going to read that portion of scripture to you again this morning. Revelation chapter 4, I'm going to read it to you from verse 1 to 8 and the Apostle John writing here, he has a vision where he is in heaven. And so that's what we have to understand. When he has this vision, he is in heaven and so in heaven there's nothing evil. So what he is seeing is actually something good. When we hear about living creatures and all of these things, sometimes we get like, is this something evil? But if if he has this vision where he, he is found in heaven, then this is a good vision, it's a good picture. And this is what he says, he says this, After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. So he is in heaven, and he says this, And the voice I had first heard speaking to me, uh, like a trumpet said, Come up here. And I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit, so he's having a vision. And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 uh, other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These were the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox, the third had the face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Such a powerful vision. As I I said, The Apostle John finds himself in heaven having this vision, but it's not an evil vision. So when we hear this thing of living creatures with eyes all around them, it's nothing evil, but it's actually a glorious image, which we get the interpretation from when we go to the book of Ezekiel, actually. So in Ezekiel chapter 1, I want to read it to you from verse 1 to 14. And last week we didn't have the time to read that. But I want you to follow with me. Ezekiel chapter 1 from verse 1 to 14. And the prophet Ezekiel is speaking here. And this is what he says. He says, In my thirteenth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day, very specific when this took place, 
While I was among the exiles by the Kiba River, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. So also this is a heavenly vision. He's seeing visions of God. And it says this, on the fifth of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, the word of the Lord came to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, by the Kiba River in the land of the Babylonians. There the hand of the Lord was on him. I looked and I saw a windstorm coming out of the north and an immense cloud with flashing lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. So similar to what John sees in the book of Revelation. It goes on to say, The center of the fire looked like glowing metal, and in the fire was what looked like four living creatures. There we find these four living creatures again. In appearance, they, their form was human, but each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight. Their feet were like those of a calf and gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings, on their four sides, they had human hands. All four of them had faces and wings, and the wings of one touched the wings of the other. Each one went straight ahead. They did not turn as they moved. Their faces looked like this. Each of the four had the face of a human being, and on the right side each had the face of a lion, and on the left side the face of an ox. Each also had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. They each had two wings spreading out upward, each wing touching that of the creature on either side, and each had two other wings covering its body. Each one went straight ahead. Wherever the spirit would go, they would go without turning as they went. The appearance of these living creatures was like burning coals of fire or like torches. Fire moved back and forth among the creatures. It was bright and lightning flashed out of it. The creatures sped back and forth like flashes of, light, of lightning. And here we just get a glimpse of what heaven is like. Just bright light, flashes of, of lightning. And later on in verse 26, from verse 26 to verse 28, Ezekiel actually interprets what he sees. And this is what he says. Ezekiel 1 from verse 26 to 28. He says, Above the vault, over the heads, was what looked like a throne of lapis lazuli. And high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. I saw that from what appeared to be his waist up, he looked like glowing metal and it was full of fire. And that from there down, he looked like fire and brilliant light surrounded him. Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell face down. He was slain in the spirit, and I heard the voice of one speaking. And what we find here is that when, what Ezekiel sees is he sees the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when he sees the glory, he's just overcome and he falls down, overcome by the glory of God. And like in the book of Revelation, contained in what he sees are these four living creatures. But unlike the book of Revelation, he sees each of these creatures with all four of these faces. Whereas John saw each creature with one of the faces, in Ezekiel, each of these creatures have all four faces. And what I said uh, last week is it's so amazing that each of these four faces correspond exactly to the facets of Jesus that are highlighted in each of the Gospels. Corresponds exactly. And while each of these faces can actually be seen in each of the Gospels, that means if we look at the Gospels of Matthew, we see all four faces. If we look at the Gospel of Mark, we see all four faces, Luke and John the same. We see the face of a, a lion, the face of an ox, the face of a man, and the face of a, an eagle. But there's one predominant face that stands out because each of these writers are trying to highlight a certain thing. And the four faces are a reflection of God's glory. And as I said last week, my prayer is that in this series, you will get a full revelation of the glory of God, the full revelation of who Jesus is. That your desire wouldn't just be to know about him, to know what he has done, but to know him intimately, to seek his face and not just his hand. 
And so this morning we're going to look at the Gospels of Matthew and the Gospels of Mark to see what facets of Jesus are highlighted in these two Gospels. Now in this series we will by no means do justice to any of these Gospels but because in actual fact you can do an entire series just on each of the Gospels. So basically what I'm attempting to do in this series is just to give you a brief overview of each Gospel and to reveal the face or the facet that is being highlighted in each of these books. What stands out? What face stands out in each of these Gospels? And what I want you to understand is this, however. It's not that we see a different Jesus in each of the Gospels. We see the same Jesus, but a different facet of him being highlighted. It's the same Jesus. But there's a different facet that stands out when we look at each of the Gospels. Now, in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is presented to us as a king, as the king of the Jews. And what Matthew is trying to show us in his Gospel is that Jesus is the Christ, the promised Messiah. And Matthew starts his Gospel with a genealogy. And sometimes we don't like to read the, these gene, genealogies, because all of these complicated names, this person begat that, uh, that person, and it, it's so complicated, but there's a purpose in that. And so I want to read Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, from both the New King James and the NIV to you this morning. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, in the New King James Version, this is what it says. It says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. I want you to notice how he starts his gospel. In the NIV, this is what it says. It says, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Abraham. Now, this one verse is so loaded in its meaning because, firstly, of that word Christ or Messiah. And the words Christ and Messiah actually have the same meaning. Sometimes we may think it's two different words, but it's actually the same word, and I'll explain it to you shortly. And so the meaning of these words, both Christ and Messiah, they mean the anointed one. So when we say Jesus Christ, it means Jesus, the anointed one. Christ is not actually Jesus' surname. <laughs> Jesus, the anointed one. And Jesus is not actually his proper name. That's the English translation. That is why we say Yeshua. Because his name was Yeshua. And the English translation of that is Jesus. Yeshua. So, the words Christ and the words Messiah have the same meaning. They mean the anointed one. And the word Christ is a transliteration of the Greek word Christos, while the word Messiah is the transliteration of the Hebrew word Mashiach. That's why Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, or Jesus the Anointed One. And so the Hebrew word and the Greek word means someone who is anointed. And as I said, the word Christ is not Jesus' surname, if you've been thinking that your whole life. It's not his surname, but it's his title. Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Anointed One. And in the Old Testament, anointing was the act of applying oil to an object or a person. And this was done by smearing oil or pouring a little bit of oil on a person or object and then rubbing it in a little bit. And that which had been anointed was then set apart for a specific or a special purpose. So when an object or a person was anointed, they were set apart for a special purpose. And anointing with oil was very common in the Old Testament, and this was the way in which someone was designated to be king. And we find countless stories of this in the Old Testament. We see David being anointed to be king. Even though Saul was king at that time, David was anointed to be the next king. The prophet Samuel comes and he anoints him, places oil upon him, and he anoints him to be king. And so the Jewish people, you have to understand, were waiting for their promised Messiah, their prophesied king. This had been prophesied throughout the Old Testament. 
and there were count countless prophecies, one of them being found in Jeremiah 23 from verse 5 to 6. And this is what it says, Jeremiah 23 from verse 5 to 6. It says this, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. And throughout the Old Testament, there are countless prophecies of someone who would come in the future in the line of David, from the same tribe of David. And David came from the, 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 the tribe of Judah. But someone would come in that line to be king in the future. And so when Matthew starts his gospel by saying, this is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham, what he is actually doing by using the term the son of David is he's using a royal title. If someone had to come through the lineage of the son of David, that, that means they came through a royal line, a royal line. And he's actually showing the Jewish people that the prophesied Messiah, the promised king, had arrived. He starts off his gospel in that way. Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, is here. He has arrived. And that king, like David, would be from the tribe of Judah. And in Revelation 5, verse 5, we see that Jesus is referred to as what? The lion of the tribe of Judah. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Revelation 5, verse 5 says this, But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And so in the Gospel of Matthew, what face do you think we see? We see the face of the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. We see Jesus as king, we see his majesty, and we see his royalty. And the Gospel of Matthew is the only Gospel in which we see the story actually of the wise men who come to present gifts to Jesus. In Matthew 2, it says this, reading from verse 1, it says this, now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying this. Now I want you to know it doesn't say three wise men, it just says wise men. Sometimes we three, say three wise men because they presented three gifts, but three gifts doesn't mean three men. And so they were just wise men. There may have been hundreds of wise men, we don't know how many came. But it says, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? King of the Jews. For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. You see, what they realized is that a king was born. And their response was to come and worship this king. This royal person, this majestic person. So in Matthew, we see Jesus' kingship being highlighted. And we see the face of a lion being revealed. Now what does a lion symbolize and what are the qualities or attributes of a lion? Now a lion symbolizes majesty, it symbolizes royalty, it symbolizes kingship, it symbolizes authority, victory, triumph, power and strength. And it's amazing in the last part of our worship, Havana didn't even know we were touching on this, but we sang about he reigns. And that is what a king does. A king reigns. A king reigns. A lion is known for its courage, its boldness, its strength, its fearlessness. But one of the main things for which a lion is known is its roar. What comes out of its mouth? You can hear a lion's roar, they say, from miles or kilometers away. And so one of the main things that the Gospel of Matthew tries to highlight is actually what is coming out of Jesus' mouth, what he says. And so that is what Matthew tries to highlight. Matthew focuses a lot on what comes out of Jesus' mouth, the words that Jesus uses. And there's a strong emphasis on the teaching of Jesus. And we find in the book of Matthew, more than any of the other 
Gospels, there's a lot of focus on the parables of Jesus. And in Matthew 13, from verse 34 to 35, this is what it says. It says this, All these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable he did not speak to them, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. And so that's what we have to realize when we read the Gospel of Matthew. Focus a lot on what Jesus says. And there's one particular message that Matthew highlights that Jesus proclaimed. And it's, it's a message that he, he, he tries to highlight throughout the Gospel of Matthew. And it's a message about the kingdom, the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus was not just the king of the Jews. He was the king of heaven. He was the king of heaven. And while the Jews were expecting Jesus to establish an earthly kingdom, that's not what he came for. He, established to br- uh, he came to bring and establish a heavenly kingdom and to inaugurate the kingdom of God. And using parables, Jesus describes what the kingdom of God is like. And so when you read the Gospel of Matthew, you'll always find Jesus describing, this is what the kingdom of God is like. He compares it to a sower, a field of wheat and tares, a mustard seed, leaven in dough, uh, a hidden treasure, a pearl of, great, of, of a, great, a great price. Always comparing, what is this kingdom of heaven like? Because it's a kingdom they had never known before. So the Gospel of Matthew is about a king and his kingdom, where we see the face of Jesus as a lion. The Gospel of Mark, however, is totally different. The Gospel of Mark is about a servant and his works. And it is here where we don't see the face of a lion, but it is here where we see the face of an ox. The face of an ox. Now an ox is symbolic of work, of lowly sacrifice, of service, of suffering. An ox is a beast of burden. Whereas this lion is this regal, majestic animal, an ox is a beast of burden. It's by no means majestic, no means royal. Definitely not like a lion. You don't go to a safari looking for an ox. You go looking for a lion. An ox is a a worker. But this is the beauty of the Gospels and how Jesus is presented. It's the amazing thing about the God that we serve. He isn't just the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he was also the ox that was brought to the slaughter, as Jeremiah 11:19 puts it in the original King James Version. In the New King James and other translations of the Bible, he's referred to as the lamb. But in the Old King James, it describes him as the ox that was led to the slaughter. Jeremiah 11:19 in the Old King James Version says this, But I was like a lamb or an ox that is brought to the slaughter, and I knew not that they had devised devices against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree with the fruit thereof, and let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name may be no more remembered. Prophetic imagery as well. But unlike the lion of the tribe of Judah, here we see this ox who had come to the world to be slaughtered and slain. A very, very different picture. In Mark, we see Jesus not as a king, but as the servant of God. And unlike Matthew, which starts with Jesus' royal lineage, the son of David, the son of Abraham, who God had given the promise to Abraham, we don't see any lineage in the Gospel of Mark at all. No genealogy at all. There is no genealogy at all if you read the Gospel of Mark. Why? Because when it comes to a servant, his family history is not important. And so that's how Mark starts his Gospel. No genealogy at all. Because a servant's history is not important. But what Mark does try to show us is he tries to show us that Jesus' life was a life of active service. And this would have appealed to the Roman mind. Remember, Mark writes his letter to the Romans. And the Romans wanted to know about the practical side of life. You know, the Romans, they were not Jewish. They knew nothing about the Old Testament. 
They knew nothing about Jewish prophets, but they were concerned about powerful leaders of authority, and they were more interested in terms of what Jesus did rather than what he said. They wanted to know this Jesus. What did he do? Why should we pay attention to him? And whereas Matthew is the link between the Old Testament and the New Testament, Mark gets straight to the point in his gospel, which is actually the shortest of the four gospels. Very, very short. He gets straight to the point. And whereas in Matthew we see Jesus' majesty and we see his royalty, in Mark we see his humility. His humility. Matthew showcases his majesty, his royalty, but in Mark we see his humility. And there's a key word we find in the Gospel of Mark, which is the Greek word euthios, which is translated immediately or straight away. We find that this word is mentioned more than 40 times in the book of Mark. And Mark shows us that Jesus' life was one of order and determination, as well as a servant's response to his master, always willing and eager to serve. And we see in the Gospel of Mark how Jesus just serves those who are around him. You see, whereas Matthew focuses on what Jesus said, Mark focuses on what Jesus did. Matthew focused more on the parables of Jesus, but Mark has a greater focus on the miracles of Jesus. In Matthew, we see the focus on the proclamation of God's kingdom, but in Mark, we see the focus on the demonstration of God's kingdom the works. And one of the key verses in the Gospel of Mark is found in chapter 10, verse 45, and this is what it says. Such a powerful portion of Scripture. Mark 10, 45 says this, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for, ma for many. And Mark also emphasized the sacrifice it takes in order for you and I to be a disciple when he highlights Jesus' words found in Mark 8 from verse 34 to 38. This is what he says. It says this, Then he called the crowd, Jesus is speaking here, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. A life of sacrifice. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their very own soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels." And so what should our response be to who Jesus is? To the fact that he's both a servant and a king. I think each and every one of us should have a desire to be more like Jesus. And as servants ourselves, we should submit to him. Just as he submitted to the will of the Father, number one, we need to submit to him. Number two, we should live a life of service of him a life of service and number three we should sacrifice for him those three things submission service and sacrifice if you and I want to follow the example of Jesus as we see in the book of Mark then it's going to take a life of submission a life of service and a life of sacrifice we find when when Jesus was told to do something or to go to a certain place he did it immediately he didn't say, you know what, I've got something else to take care of, I'm a bit busy, you know, maybe I'll come help you another time, I'll heal you another time. No, it was a life of service. And sometimes in our own life, we, are, we get so busy, and we don't realize our life should be a life of service unto the king. But as our king, Jesus being our king, what should our response be? Number one, we should give adoration to him, and that adoration is called worship. He is a king. And just as the wise men came to worship him, every time we come into his presence, it should be the desire to worship him. Not only is, the king of the, is he the king of the Jews, but he is the king of heaven. He is our king. Number two, we should walk in the authority he has given us. 
And in Matthew 6, 19, it says that Jesus has given us the keys of the kingdom. Whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever we loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So as sons and daughters of the king, we have to realize that he has delegated authority to us. And number three, we should be ambassadors for him. As a child of the king, are you being an ambassador? Is your lifestyle a reflection of the kingdom of God? Or is it a reflection of the kingdom of darkness? So adoration, authority, and the third A, ambassadors. So how do we juxtapose these two distinctly different faces or features of Jesus Christ? Jesus the Anointed One, Jesus the Messiah, the Lion and the Ox. How do we harmonize this? Because they are so completely different. A king and a servant. And I love how Pastor Bill Johnson puts it. And this is what he says, and this is what I want to end with this morning. He says this, For us, we should rule with the heart of a servant and serve with the heart of a king. Rule with the heart of a servant and serve with the heart of a king. And that should be our response to our Lord, to our Master, to our King. Just as He was both a king and a servant, let us endeavor to be just like He is. Rule with the heart of a servant, but let us also serve with the heart of a king. Mm -hmm.